Latin does have a strong effect. Uh, and we've recognized that the way you model diffusion, so the types of assumptions you make, is actually really critical to understanding this. So you have to be very careful about the assumptions that you make. Now, but, but what we haven't quite figured out is exactly what the fundamental mechanism making that change is. We're doing another round of tests right now that are using what's called a Lagrangian approach. So previously we did an Eulerian approach, which is, so you have an engine, and fuel comes in one side and goes out the other side. And you just look at the engine and you average everything that's passing through it. The Lagrangian approach is you have an engine, but I, you actually really care about how an individual particle goes. So you put a particle at the beginning and you actually track it through the engine to see what it's doing. Uh, and so we're hoping that this new approach will give us more information. But right now, I, I, we don't actually have any good information beyond that. We've discovered that there is a difference. We don't necessarily understand why. So, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> If you're working with respect to this, um, uh, uh, I mean, aromatic compounds, uh, especially, I, I know toluene has some um, uh, carcinogenic uh, concerns. Uh, do you do you look at um, the hydrocarbons from any angle of, of safety? Yeah. So, sorry, say that again. Uh, I, most aromatic carbons uh, compounds, uh, aromatic compounds, would usually have. Fail to fail. Yes. Have you are you thinking alongside the health effects of these aromatic compounds that are also foils that you're working on? Yeah, we are. So the goal is so so these these uh, aromatics already exist in fuel. So we're not adding them. We're trying to understand how they're burning because we, when you think about an engine, we don't actually know how an engine works as well as we think we do. We understand the mechanics because we've built that part, but the combustion that occurs inside it is very poorly understood. So we're burning these fuels to understand how, to better understand what they do and to better understand what types of chemicals they produce so we can understand those health effects better but we're also trying to mitigate those health effects. So by improving our knowledge of how these fuels combust, we can engineer the fuels more effectively so that we need less of the fuel to get the same amount of energy out and then ultimately reduce those negative health effects or impacts on climate change. Yeah. All right, so uh, when, in regards to the jet fuel in retrospective, because there's, in my mind, there's two different kinds of jets. There's like the 747, and then there's the military type jet. Is that what you're talking about with the different types of fuel and the different jobs that they're trying to produce? Yeah, so it's interesting. Or is that two different engines doing different jobs with the fuel? Both. So there are three main fuels that we use in, in really across the world. So there's, there's Jet A, um, which is called Jet A1 in Europe which is the primary commercial fuel that we use. Uh, that's, if you flew on an aircraft today, a jet aircraft, you would use Jet A. Um, and then the military has a range of fuels and they primarily use JP-8 and JP-5. Um, and all three of those fuels burn relatively similarly, but they do have slightly different characteristics in how likely they are to combust. Uh, so for example, um, Jet A is kind of right in the middle. JP8 is easy to combust. JP5 is relatively difficult to combust. And they're used in different places depending on what kind of energy extraction you need. Um, that being said, most jet aircraft or military aircraft also use Jet A. So if you're thinking like a, like a C-130 or any type of military personnel carrier or shipping aircraft is going to use Jet A uh, or, or could use Jet A, um, a lot of these aircraft can use multiple different fuels. Now, the, the reason we only have these three fuels is actually until very recently, so my master's work, my previous experimental work, and this, this new work, we've developed several tools that have brought the cost of analyzing fuel down dramatically. Uh, 
So previously, the only way we could look at a fuel was to buy a couple million gallons of fuel and a couple engines that we wanted to test. And we would just run the fuel through the engine until either the engine broke or we ran out of fuel. And through that, we'd collect all this data and that would give us a good understanding of if that fuel worked in that specific engine and that was about it. And because of this, the only industry that really could afford to do it was the United States Air Force. Uh, no one else really could justify that expense, which is why we've only really had one commercial jet fuel for the history of aviation. So what we've done to change that is instead of looking at it in a, a practical application, we, take, we took a step back and we said, okay, well, the parameters that we're looking at, we can recreate in the lab. And if we measure the characteristic parameters of those fuels rather than their practical effects, we can predict the practical effects um, but save a lot of money. So now instead of using, you know, millions of dollars to do this, we could take about three to six gallons of jet fuel and over the course of a week or two run the tests we need to get those characterizations and, and understand things a lot better. Um, I will say the one practical result of that has been on the FAA project that we don't yet have a sufficient understanding to justify moving to a different fuel. So in this, we've, we've looked at biofuels, so jet fuels from ethanol or other um, agricultural products. We've looked at alcohol-based jet fuels, uh, and we've looked at other synthetics. And our results have said, yeah, these could be good, but we don't have enough information right now because there's some other stuff that we don't fully understand. So for the time being, we're going to continue using those three primary fuels that I discussed, Jet A, JP8, and JP5, uh, because it's better to be safe than sorry. We don't want to accidentally put a new fuel into use and then have missed something and you know have something horrible go wrong. Because when we're talking about air travel, we're talking about a lot of potential for disaster. Yeah. So, and then another thing I wanted to ask was, um, you said that the uh, the like what I'm trying to understand is like, are we trying to find a better engine, or are we trying to find a better use of the fuel inside said engine? more efficiently we can build a smaller engine it, smaller engines are really good because they weigh less the biggest barrier to air travel is weight so the smaller we can make things the better so that's that's one side is understanding the fuel better so we can make a better engine the second part is understanding is ignoring the engine and saying okay well fundamentally liquid fuels are the best for air travel because of their energy density if we're going to use them, we need to use them most efficiently. So can we engineer fuels that have the effect we need, uh, give, us, give us the energy we need, and reduce the harmful effects? And that is on the fuel engineering side. I work right in the middle trying to communicate between the two groups. What's the, uh, what's the like, is, so we're trying to reduce the amount of waste uh, like, the, like to make sure that we don't have to use as much fuel uh, for a job that we could use less fuel for? Yes. So for the fuel side, the, the three, we want to reduce how much fuel we need. So we want to basically increase fuel economy. So we want the miles per gallon to go way up. Um, we want to reduce the emissions. So we're always going to have CO2 right? Because when you burn a hydrocarbon, you always get carbon dioxide. But we want to avoid other things like sulfate compounds, nitrogen compounds. We want to reduce carbon monoxide. And we want to develop ways that we can sequester this, the carbon dioxide as it's coming out of the exhaust. So that think about things like, like in your car, you have a catalytic converter, okay? And that, that helps make sure that you're minimizing nitrogen release and minimizing carbon monoxide release. And actually, car, catalytic converters in cars are so effective now that the in, air coming out of your car is actually cleaner than the air coming into it, which is a, an interesting thought. But that technology doesn't quite work the same in jet engines because you're talking about much higher temperatures. You've got other, other problems. The other thing is a lot of jet aircraft, so think like... Um, like a 737, like a standard uh, aircraft, like even the most efficient ones of those still are releasing unburnt jet fuel out of their exhaust, which is another big problem, right? We don't want to be dumping jet fuel that we're not burning. We want to be able to burn that and use it effectively. 
Um, and so, that, yeah, so let's see. So one is increased fuel economy. The other is decreased emissions. Uh, and then the last one is making sure that our fuels are stable and, and don't have negative health impacts, right? And so that goes back to understanding, like, generation of soot from uh, burning aromatics, right? That can be really bad, so it's very harmful to the environment. It's harmful to us. We're going to minimize that, those, those effects as well. And then the last thing I want to know is like, what is what is the, uh, this is kind of like physics and chemistry, at, at a high altitudes and high speeds, how does that affect the way that the engine is? Because if you if you burn the, uh, the regular uh, gas in a car on the ground going at regular speeds, yeah. uh, what is the difference between like the pressure and the amount of the, the amount of like uh, stuff that needs to go into the technology to like get the gas exactly where it needs to go? Uh, how to ignite it? Like you, you were talking about it earlier, but I'm I, I'm I'm in the introductory chemistry and yeah. I, I wasn't asking. So <laughs> I wasn't engines, that. engines are really great. So the first thing a jet engine does is it takes in the air and it slows it way down. So you I mean your plane's moving very fast, right? So the first thing you have to do is slow the air down. And if you talk about any, and that's true for any aircraft that is air breathing, including our supersonic aircraft. Um, and we do that in different ways. Um, I will say the way that mili the military does it for supersonic aircraft is very clever. They actually use um, shocks. They make a shock wave because things slow down very quickly through a shock wave. The way we do it on a commercial aircraft is we just use a compressor. And we take in that air, and then we increase the pressure using a compressor. And we have to increase that a lot. And the reason is because when you're at, alt at altitude, you're below atmospheric pressure, right? So pressure decreases as you go up. You, you know, when you're driving up a hill, your ears pop. So that makes low pressure is very difficult to burn in. So we need to increase the pressure. And typically, we increase it quite a bit. Um, once you get to that, you have a nice, happy condition for combustion. Um, one Another thing that some other students uh, here at Oregon State are looking at is what happens if that stops, because if you stop, if your combustion goes out, all of these processes stop because the combustion is also what's powering your compressor. And so all of a sudden you do have an environment where your engine now is at the altitude, at atmospheric pressure, which could be below um, ambient which is bad, and so we're looking at what's called high altitude relight. So this is actually really common for military aircraft that do um, very specific maneuvers, is if your engine goes out at altitude, can we reignite it more effectively um, to kind of mitigate these problems that you're talking about? Um, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else have a question related to the mechanism? Yeah, and the, the hoodie. <laughs> I keep pointing at you, and then I realize you can't, like, pointing is, like, useless if I'm on a screen. <laughs> nope, I can't, I can't say that again. I couldn't hear you. But the amount of oxygen also has something to do with the combustion side of the engine. Yep. So, and, yeah, that's right. And that has to do with why we increase the pressure. So we can't add more oxygen to the air. But what we can do is by increasing the pressure, we can provide more available air because you're just taking all that air and cramming it into a smaller space. So that helps with making sure there's sufficient oxygen to burn things correctly. Yeah. Environmentally safe. Is it environmentally safe? Um, well, it's, it's not ideal. Uh, what I like to tell people is my favorite part of working in combustion is my goal is to work to a point where I don't have a job anymore. And what I mean by that is burning fossil fuels is, is bad. We don't want to do that. But at the time, at right now and for the foreseeable future, there are applications where we don't have an option. So like cars, yeah, we have electric alternatives to cars. We should do that. Power plants where we're burning coal, we don't need to do that anymore. We have other, we have other better options. But things like large oil tankers, um, semi-trucks and aircraft where we need a lot of power to be able to get from point A to point B and we rely on that economically. So if you think about it, like shipping is a huge industry. If all of a sudden we stopped shipping things, the world economy would just erupt into chaos. So we need to sustain that and to be able to do that effectively, we have to have some trade-offs. So we're trying to 
get combustion, so it's so good that it's it's like anything else, but that's never going to happen. It's always going to have some environmental downsides. And so in the meantime, we're also doing research to on ways to replace those the, the, the need for fossil fuel combustion. Yeah, the yellow shirt. I thought you mentioned that you were researching on pure hydrogen. Um, did yeah. you, what do you find? Um, so... <sighs> Hydrogen is very interesting because it's extremely diffusive. So it is, it wants to go everywhere. And it's really difficult to not get it to go everywhere. And what we've found is we used hydrogen as a specific test case for this new tool we developed. So um, previously, it's been extremely expensive to do simulations looking at diffusion. Because diffusion, you have to solve a lot of equations. So so imagine you have a big three-dimensional grid, okay? Um, in it, so there's going to be some x component, some y component, and some z component, okay? So that gives you my volume. So let's say x times y times z. Well, now I want to. I have that many equations I have to solve, okay? Well, now I want to do that over some time. So I have x times y times z times time, okay? Then at all of those points, I have to solve the number of chemical species equations as well, which can be anywhere from uh, hundreds to thousands. Okay, so I have x times y times z times time times the number of species, uh, the chem number of chemical species. Now, if I add diffusion into that, because diffusion is every molecule diffuses into every other molecule, you have to do x times y times z times time times the number of species, or times the number of chemical equations times the number of chemical species squared. And when you have that squared term, all of a sudden you go from something being expensive but manageable to something being unrealistic. And so what we've done is developed a tool that allows us to do that same math to simulate these flames, but take that squared term and reduce it so instead of using hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes of memory, we only use about six kilobytes of memory, which allows us to like run through those simulations much quicker, more affordably, uh, and the hydrogen was valuable because by by correcting those if we know that we know how hydrogen should behave and so it's a good way of telling us if our tool is working correctly does that make sense yes so would you say that you know to do something that you do you, would, you should have a really solid math background right <laughs> yeah but I'm working on a journal publication right now. I, I, it's got, I think, 45 equations in it at the moment, and it's still going. Um, yeah, you need a strong background, but it's not. To do any type of engineering, you really need a lot of bat math. So, I mean, especially at community college, I would highly recommend you get your math courses out of the way. So uh, integral calculus, derivative calculus, multivariable calculus, differential equations, uh, linear algebra, sequences and series, all of those are ones you should be taking now. Um, they're great, and the value of a community college is you get a smaller classroom, and so you get a better experience in that course. At university, if you take one of those, there's, I don't know, 150 kids in the class, and it gets a little bit overwhelming. Um, but yeah, you, you need a lot of math background. Um, I will say, if you go the experimental route, you don't do the same level of calculus as what you do in the numerical side. So just by the nature of how simulations work, we're trying to solve the math that describes the physics, right? And so that math is inherently got a lot of challenges. But if you're doing an experiment, you don't need to solve the math because you have the experiment, right? It's already there. All you have to do is measure it. Um, the reason we have to do both is if you think about combustion, most of the things that you would want to use to measure your experiment will either melt or not work in a combustion environment because it's really hot. Uh, so for example, measuring the temperature of a jet fuel flame is extremely difficult because it burns hotter than most metals will sustain. So for example, a thermocouple, so common, like when you take your temperature, like the digital thermometer, that's a thermocouple. If I get a really fancy one of those and put it in a jet fuel flame, it'll it'll melt pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so we have to come up with other ways to, to measure those things, and it's, it's very difficult. And so the, the numerical side helps us to get data that we wouldn't otherwise be able to get. But you got to do both of them. You know, I'm just curious about, um, at, at the beginning, you mentioned uh, uh, Dutch well versus a battery <laughs> to, yep, run, yep. to run a, a, a plane. So what, what are the advances that has been done as that alternative way of energy? Oh, for batteries? Yeah. So there's a lot of research going being done for an electric aircraft. Um, and we can do electric aircraft for things like a, a, a like a prop plane. So if you have a plane that runs on a propeller and you're only carrying a couple people for a few hundred miles, we can do that okay. But if you're talking about a jet airliner where you're moving hundreds of people over very large distances very quickly, the batteries are just too heavy. And even the most like there's a there's a theoretical limit to what batteries could do. Um, it, it, we refer to it as the lithium air battery. Um, but, and it's basically, it's a really hyper-efficient lithium-ion battery. It's about 10 times more eff efficient than current lithium-ion batteries, um, at least from energy density, so how much energy a given weight of battery can hold. But jet fuel is still 40 times more effective at holding energy than current fuels, so, or than current batteries. So, I mean, like, even if we get to the best possible battery, we're still orders of magnitude off from what from liquid what liquid fuels can provide. So there's also look at work being done at um, hydrogen fuel cell hydrogen fuel cell technology that's very promising um, because condensed hydrogen is very a very efficient energy source. I mean that's why we use it as rocket fuel. Um, but again, it's we have prototypes for hydrogen powered aircraft. Um, we're working on prototypes for battery-powered aircraft, but I wouldn't expect to see anything in production or in commercial use before uh, probably at least another 30 years. And the problem is we've got about 30 years before we irreparably damage our planet. <laughs> so we need to be working on alternatives in the, in the meantime. Yeah, so one question. Um, I wonder, so why not solar? It sounds like, you know, what, is, is there any kind of hybrid uh, plane that would take the jet fuels plus another uh, type of batteries? Wait, or did you say about solar or? Yeah, I'm well, not about solar in particular because, you know, once you are above the clouds, there's. Solar. Yeah, so solar, solar electric is just really bad at converting solar energy to electricity. Um, Solar thermal is better, but it's very, very heavy. Uh, it's just, it, I mean, typically like a typical solar panel is at the most 30% efficient. Um, and it's, and I mean, if you think about the amount of area that you have on an aircraft, even if every inch of that was solar panels, it's just not enough energy. Now there are, there's a lot of really interesting work being done on hybrid jet engines, which use a combination of, of batteries and a conventional jet engine together. Um, and those are much closer to release, but they, again, they're a stepping stone, right? It's like, it's like we had F-150s and then Toyota said, hey, look, there's this thing called a Prius. Let's drive that. And like, you have this like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to go from my cool truck to this thing. And now we're going, now Tesla's like, oh, look, we've got a better alternative, right? And so it's the same thing in the jet aircraft industry is we've got, you know, all of these current electric or current gas powered engines, and we're going to move to hydrogen fuel or uh, hydrogen fuel cell technology and, and hybrid technology as that intermediate. And then hopefully, ideally, we figure out another way to do it. Are your findings uh, public? Like, are you writing anything? Uh, it, like, whoever is giving you grants and funds and stuff like that, yep. are you allowing your research? To be everything, everything is public. If you want to check out um, the FAA stuff, you can go to. I think if you Google FAA Ascent Project, uh, it, it'll take you to the. I don't remember what the website is. Hold on. Um, my thesis is available online uh, at ajfilo.com. If you want to check that out. Um, and then all the journal publications that we're working on, we we um, we make them openly available as well. Uh, 
And the Ascent project is a collaboration with um, hundreds of other researchers across the world. Um, okay, so it's, it's ascent.aero, A-E-R-O. And that'll take you to the, the, the landing page so you can get to looking at all the research and results and everything that's available. Here, here at uh, Captain City, um, we have a NASA base here. Right here. Um, I think the leverage is right here. Could this sound similar to you? Uh, do you guys have any collaboration with that uh, NASA Langley or right here? I, I don't personally work with Langley. Um, we have some collaborators at NASA, but they're, uh, I want to say they're at JPL, so over here in California, on, on the on the West Coast in California. Um, I actually work with, I collaborate a lot with uh, Caltech, um, and Caltech and JPL are, are actually, so JPL, is, it's a NASA campus run by Caltech, which is an interesting thing. So, um, and that's just because, so the combustion research on a governmental level is kind of split into a couple main groups. So a lot of those are on the West Coast, and that's Cendia National Lab, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, NASA JPL, um, and then the main universities, so UW, WashU, Oregon State, Stanford, uh, Caltech, UCLA, USC, they all, they're all big players. And then... The other big groups are at Purdue on the East Coast, uh, Maryland, Uni Uni University of Maryland, um, and they work closely with the Office of Naval Research and the Air Force Research Laboratory, which are also both. So uh, ONR, the Office of Naval Research, is in Maryland, and um, AFRL is it's on the East Coast. I think I want to say it's by the... It's by the Aviation Museum, but not not the Smithsonian. So we do that with uh, our students. Some of us have classes. I've seen that the places that you have mentioned, they probably have summer internships, right? Oh yeah, they all they all do, and they have they have summer internships ranging from undergraduate level where you're at right now, all the way up to PhD level. Um, and they're, I, I mean, all you got to do is apply online. They're, I highly recommend those. They're really fantastic. So when it comes to, uh, from the economic and funding standpoint of it, is it like, is a military someone that actually gets involved with your particular uh, class a lot? Like field research a lot? Uh, yeah, so it's interesting. The comb combustion funding has this weird uh, kind of boomerang thing going on. So every five to six years, the FAA, the Air Force, the Navy will all get together and they'll be like, we should really research this more. And they'll, they'll put, make a bunch of money available. But because combustion is really hard to find anything because it's so difficult to measure things and it's expensive to do these simulations, you know, we'll make a little incremental improvement, right? We'll, we'll learn, we'll add a little bit to the knowledge of the world. And then it, it won't be fast enough for them because they want results now. Right, and so then they'll be like, ah, you know, what? we're done. We're not going to pay for it anymore. And so we're kind of ending this last cycle, and then another couple years, they're going to be like, hey, you know, we should look at this again, and it'll come back. Um, I will say the organizations that are always looking at combustion: uh, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, the Air Force, because th they kind of need it a lot, uh, and then uh, uh, the National Science Foundation. So they're, they're, they're pretty stable. But these, these bigger kind of joint collaborations like the FAA Ascent Project are every couple of years. OK, so um, we're going to have to close because um, uh, AJ, can I call you that? Yeah, that's right. absolutely. Uh, OK, he has a class that he has to teach with me. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we will. So uh, what I'm going to do is if you have more questions, I can give you his contact information. And uh, you can get in touch with him. Uh, hopefully, you'll be happy to answer questions uh, that are forwarded to you after this time. Okay, so um, we really say thank you. We're so grateful that you're able to spare this time um, to answer questions and uh, to discuss with us. So, um, good luck at your PhD too. <laughs> oh, yeah, good luck at your PhD too. Yeah, so thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.